that I'd like to, well, I'd like to begin tonight with this image that you see here. Um, this is the so-called rainbow sculpture, which was installed in a public square in Warsaw in 2012, you can see. It had previously been installed for a year in front of the European Parliament in Brussels. It was not explicitly a gay rights monument, but it was naturally interpreted as such um, by both Polish LGBT activists and their opponents. It sparked numerous arson attempts. In the picture here, you can see that it's halfway burned down. Um, and a lot of criticism. After it was, and it was burned down several times. Um, each time it was burned down, it was then rebuilt painstakingly um, by hand by volunteers. And it also mobilized a large scale signature campaign to defend it with names like Freedom Cannot Be Burned. So what do we make of this symbol? What do we make of this episode? On the one hand, we could ask, is it a sign of the rejection of transnational rights norms in countries that were only relatively recently admitted to the European Union, and thus the weakness of transnational or international institutions and their associated <coughs> advocacy networks? to transform politics on the ground in Eastern Europe and other parts of the global rights periphery. Um, or might we say, on the other hand, that it's a sign of a great but very contentious shift underway in Poland, a country that exemplifies this global rights periphery, especially with respect to LGBT rights. So recall that it's, a, it's, a, it's the visibility of the symbol um, that, that we would take with this interpretation, that it's, it's persistent defenders. So the question that I'd like to pose for today's talk is, as you can see here, how and when might transnational norms and networks promote LGBT movements on the rights periphery, even when that promotion sparks domestic backlash? I think this is an important question because, uh, for our times, because on the one hand, you know, as you know, LGBT issues have become increasingly visible. Um, secondly, LGBT advocates have become increasingly linked up across national boundaries. And third, there's been considerable progress on the policy front, um, especially with regard to things like same-sex partnerships. It's also important because for all the progress that we just noted, outside the LGBT rights core, speaking broadly here, but what, by that I mean like the United States and Western Europe, those countries where the LGBT movement sort of first developed um, and is most organized, outside of that core, there are significant barriers to LGBT rights uh, and the movements that advocate them. These include a weak civil society, which makes it difficult to be an activist, um, and a legacy of re repressing homosexuality. So what I'd like to do tonight is, um, first of all, talk about why post-communist Europe is a good window for thinking about this question of transnational LGBT advocacy um, and, and social movements. Think about some of the uh, theoretical approaches that we see in the literature. Um, and then talk about the argument that I make and the question that I address is, which is how and when backlash could actually end up strengthening and helping build LGBT movements. And then I'd like to illustrate this with some snapshots uh, of movement development in Poland um, and the Czech Republic, and then conclude by sort of trying to think about sort of implications and lessons. Okay. Um, well, so my first contention, um, one of the first contentions in the book, that this post-communist uh, Eastern Europe is a really good place for looking at uh, the question of um, uh, exploring this question on the rights periphery. Um, as I mentioned, there's a legacy of weak civil society, and you know you can look at a lot of literature that describes this outside of the area of LGBT rights, people like Mark Howard. Um, second, there is a legacy, as we mentioned, of repression of homosexuality under communism, and maybe you know, but the communist authorities generally saw homosexuality as either a social disorder, in the good cases, um, or as a criminal offense, in the bad cases. And as a result, um, under communism, people were very uh, private about their sexual orientation. Um, they did not publicize it. Um, 
and there were a lot of negative stereotypes, and invisibility was the norm. The evidence of these legacies is still very much present today. Um, and you can see it in public attitudes, you can see it in public policies, you can see it in political culture. So just to kind of give you a, a sense of that, um, next slide I want to show you um, is a slide of attitudes towards homosexuality in Western Europe and um, post-communist Europe compared around 1998-2002. Um, and the point I think you can you know, draw away from this is there is variation both in post-communist countries and in Western Europe, of course, but it's kind of like when you move from one region to the other, you shift everything down <laughs> several notches, right? Um, so the, the most tolerant are, are no longer so tolerant when you compare them to Western Europe. I mean, everything gets mocked down a few notches. Um, another comparison you could do is to look at um, public policy, so policies for LGBT uh, people. And this is uh, using uh, comparative work that was done by the uh, International Lesbian and Gay Association of Europe, um, where they kind of look at all the legislation in various countries in Europe and, and rank them on a kind of uh, rainbow index, as they call it. And the, 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 the thing that you would take from this is that it's precisely kind of the same picture that you saw with attitudes. Everything is kind of shifted down a notch when you move um, from West Europe, uh, Western Europe to post-communist Europe. We might also think about uh, political culture, and political culture is a kind of broad concept, but one measure of kind of thinking about sort of the openness of a society to minority groups um, and sort of non-traditional lifestyles um, is developed by um, Ronald Englehart and his collaborators within the World Value Survey. They have this idea of post-material values, and post-material values have these two sides to them. One side is uh, kind of traditional versus secular values, and the other dimension of it is what they call survival values versus self-expression values. So survival values are values in countries where the political culture is really concerned with sort of kind of getting by and, and sort of meeting basic needs. Um, and then in um, usually wealthier countries, uh, on the opposite side, you have uh, political cultures which are about expressing the individual and the individual's kind of self-expression of, 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 their, of their identity. So if you look at... Um, kind of, as was depicted here in the slide, you know, you can see that West European countries tend towards the kind of upper right-hand side of this box. So um, they are, they, they value self-expression, they are largely secular. Um, if you look at post-communist countries, they are more on the closed side, more kind of closed societies. And the two countries that I'm going to be focusing on today, just to highlight here, Czech Republic and Poland, you can see kind of are actually at sort of different ends within um, post-communist set. Okay. So going back. Um, another reason why post-communist Europe is a good place to look at these questions is that there is actually a very high exposure uh, in this region to transnational norms and networks that promote LGBT um, rights. And that has to do with the proximity to Western Europe, <coughs> and more importantly, the European Union. So since the early 1990s, EU membership was kind of the first and uh, foremost pri uh, foreign policy goal of pretty much every East European state. Um, and over that same period, the EU became an international <coughs> leader in uh, promotion of LGBT rights. And it applied a lot of pressure on applicant states to adopt minority rights policies, and it conferred a lot of legitimacy and resources on LGBT uh, activist groups in those countries. Uh, as we see here, next uh, kind of important reason for looking at this region is there are lots of instances where this promotion that we just described uh, triggered a kind of backlash response, a domestic backlash response. Um, and we're, that's something that we've been kind of familiar with, looking at the newspapers over time, things like banning pride parades, violence against LGBT persons, homophobic rhetoric by national politicians, even laws against homosexual propaganda. And last of all, uh, it's interesting because there's something that's maybe less often noticed, and that is uh, the organization of activism. So looking at the kinds of social movements that have developed, and there's actually a surprising amount of variation that's um, developed over time. In the early 1990s, LGBT activism across post-communist countries looked pretty much the same. It was informally organized, it was locally based, and it was apolitical. It was oriented towards self-help groups, 
um, and provision of services. By the end of the period that I was looking at, in like 2010, 2011, um, some of these uh, social movements in some of these countries had made huge progress on all of these dimensions. For example, Poland, and Poland is kind of surprising in this respect. You, in Poland, you have a very professionally organized and institutionalized um, advocacy network. It, it's national level, it spreads, it's not just in the main cities, it spreads out to um, all the regions of Poland. It, and it's politically oriented and even electorally mobilized. So um, Poland is a good example of just how, how much things changed um, in some places. And so that's what I'm going to focus on today, the organization of activism. Just to give you a sense of how um, some other people in literature have sort of thought about thinking about, uh, thought about this, um, you know, there's a couple approaches by which uh, transnational norms and networks uh, you know, have been able to strengthen LGBT movements, it's argued in the literature. And before I go into this, let me just make two notes. First of all, I'll be describing this kind of process in post-communist countries, the, the LGBT rights periphery, so to speak. I think uh, the politics of LGBT social movements and sort of their development is different in the poor countries, um, as you know, the literature has shown, in these countries it was more of a domestic process, and um, so that's an important distinction to bear in mind. And the other thing I would say here is don't take these different things I'm about to say as sort of like some mutually exclusive hypotheses that we're going to sort of pit against each other. I would think of them more as kind of um, emphases, differences in analytical emphasis. Okay, so first of all, there's a kind of Europeanization model. It's a very influential school, it's, not, and it's much broader than LGBT rights and social movements, but it argues that the EU is the ultimate institutionalized transnational network, and it can reshape domestic politics by offering accession. And this uh, gives it two mechanisms. One, it can offer incentives and, and, and use conditionality um, to, to get norm compliance. So in response to the um, benefits or threats of sanction. Of course, the flip side of this is that once countries join the European Union, um, that leverage disappears. There's also a notion, uh, uh, an argument in this that, that some of this norm compliance comes about through uh, a persuasion of the appropriateness of EU norms, and this is called kind of social learning. Um, so when I was looking at this, I, you know, made the point that this model has a hard time making sense of backlash, which is like when we look at LGBT rights, that's a very important part of the, the story. Um, and there's a lot of puzzles for a kind of Europeanization theorist. First of all, why is it that social movements are stronger when um, EU conditionality is weakest? So after they join the EU, that's when kind of a lot of the organization occurs. Um, and secondly, if you think about social learning, you would predict that it should have very little um, norm compliance and sort of uh, social movement organization because there's a clash between EU norms and local ones. The second way of thinking about this is the so-called boomerang model, which is, um, I think, does a much better job of dealing with backlash. And the basic point of this is that um, it sort of describes a way in which transnational networks and, and local social movements can work together, um, and by which Domestic social movements can go around kind of recalcitrant national governments or domestic opponents by appealing to supranational level or transnational level um, against the kind of domestic political elites. A couple of questions with this is, of course, however, like what sustains the LGBT movements in the hostile domestic environment? Um, what gives them visibility? And um, should we assume that they're savvy enough to kind of reach out and go around the domestic um, opponents? So a third kind of model I just threw out at you is a kind of gridlock model. Um, and this, this model, I think, is interesting because it really takes the opponents of LGBT rights very seriously um, and the backlash that they create. But I would argue it's a bit too pessimistic about the consequences of backlash. So essentially, it argues that for every kind of transnational progressive uh, network, there's also a transnational conservative network opposing it. So sometimes this is called the Burqa Bible Network. Um, and that these two are kind of constantly fighting with each other, and the, the, the um, 
end result is gridlock, nothing gets done. Um, they kind of, both sides cancel each other out. I would say that this is a bit too pessimistic, and the, the reason it's too pessimistic is because it focuses only on policy and policy changes, which aren't very many when this is happening. Um, but policy is not everything. Uh, it ignores organization, and it uh, ignores the dynamics of social movement growth, which may move at different speeds than policy change. Um, so the last one, kind of approach here, the one that I see myself as a part of, uh, is one that uh, we could call the backlash approach. Um, and you know, some other examples of it are Philip Ayub and Agnieszka Graf. Um, <coughs> but basically, this uh, it, we don't or this approach doesn't reduce contention to policy battles. So outcomes are, aren't limited to you know, policy change or lack thereof. It pays much more attention to movement, visibility, movement, organization. Um, and it pays attention to the frailty of LGBT movements in weak civil societies. And I think a kind of assumption of this is that absent transnational pressures, movements face this kind of strongly kind of entropic pressure, this kind of environment which tends to break them down because it's hard to sustain activism. Um, and I'd say the last thing is there's a, a sensitivity to domestic context and historical process sort of as it unfolds. And the basic I, you know, argument is that under the right conditions, domestic backlash can actually um, help organize and help build uh, LGBT activism. So with all that, Prelude. Um, just to get back to the question of how and when um, these kind of transnational pressures may lead to um, stronger LGBT movements, the first thing I'd like to talk about is the, the how question. So how is it that this kind of these two levels can work together? So I focus on three in the book. I focus on three mechanisms by which um, this. Uh, how how question occurs. So first of all, I argue that um, backlash transforms the visibility and the framing of homosexuality in post-communist countries. So first of all, it really increases visibility of an issue which, as we mentioned before, previously was invisible, was taboo, was not something that was publicly discussed, was not considered part of the public sphere. Um, they also change the framing of homosexuality. So sort of the, the way in which sort of the early 90s, if you go back and look at the kind of discourse around <laughs> homosexuality and the, the way homosexuality was framed, it tended to be framed either in terms of morality or immorality or charity towards the sinner. This was kind of like the Polish uh, version. Or as therapy and self-help, as a kind of something that psychology could help uh, deal with. Um, it was not typically presented as like something about rights. Um, so with the arrival of the EU and kind of in the uh, beginning of the accession, a new kind of framing of homosexuality was made possible, which, which uh, framed in terms of EU rights and standards. And this kind of frame, at least initially, was very attractive to the activists themselves, but it wasn't that uh, necessarily persuasive outside the movement. It wasn't something that was taken up outside the movement, at least early on. But what happened was, once the kind of back, uh, backlash kicked in, um, what you saw was that the hard right, the kind of critics of homosexuality, they themselves stopped talking about homosexuality as like therapy or morality um, and charity. They thought of, they started talking about it as an EU issue, as something the EU was doing against the country, um, but nonetheless, they were increasing the kind of credibility of framing this in EU terms. Okay, so the second thing, uh, the way in which backlash helped build a movement was it builds internal solidarity within the movement. So um, that's another way, another way of saying that it helps overcome the barriers that all social movements face, which is you know, how to motivate people to contribute to collective action. Um, and as we mentioned before, in post-communist countries, um, that those kind of previous or those kind of pre-existing structures that mobilize people tend to be weak. The civil society is weak. 
So how is it that, that this kind of backlash helps build a solidarity? Well, the argument here, um, I mean, really borrow heavily from um, some social movement theory associated with David Snow and others, uh, they have this idea of this immediate protective surround. And the immediate protective surround is this kind of zone uh, that people feel around themselves. And in the, in the kind of daily life, you have these sort of routines and expectations that you take for granted. Um, and they kind of help you get by and negotiate the world. But at certain moments, those uh, routines uh, that protective surround becomes threatened. And when that protective surround is threatened, um, people are more likely to then sort of uh, take action to kind of prevent the, the loss. And so this, this theory is kind of based on this finding in psychology that you know, people are very averse to, to loss and they'll take great risk to avoid losing something. They'll take more risk to avoid losing something than they will to get a potential gain. So, um, so this is the, this is an important kind of connection that helps understand why in a weak social environment this kind of threat to the collective surround can have this galvanizing effect. And the third thing is I would say that the backlash tends to draw allies to the movement. It draws allies from people who may also or consider themselves liberal, who consider themselves EU supporters, but wouldn't otherwise really think about LGBT issues. Um, but when the EU, or when homosexuality becomes framed as an EU issue, um, they're more likely to kind of come in and sort of uh, lend support and lend legitimacy or, uh, to the movement. So then the next question is when? When do, when do all of these things happen? Um, and it's not, I argue that um, kind of the conditions where these happen, it's not going to happen everywhere. Um, and to put it as succinctly as possible, this kind of virtuous cycle of backlash um, happens when transnational pressures boost, uh, or it, it happens when uh, the hard right becomes politically pivotal in a comparatively closed society. And so I'll sort of explain um, how the logic of that works. Um, but in this figure here is to kind of show some of the combinations of, of these possible under this framework. So the first is how open is the society's political culture? And I already showed you that before when we were talking about Engelhardt's like survival value and that kind of thing. So we have on the one hand closed societies and open societies, more, more or less tolerant of um, minority groups and non-traditional lifestyles. And then for the other axis we have the hard right and how sort of politically influential and pivotal the hard right is in politics. So the hard right is a category that consists, I define as a category consisting of parties that actively and publicly oppose homosexuality. And I can talk about sort of how I code the parties for that um, if you're interested. But typically hard right parties are usually like on the fringe of politics. Um, but sometimes they can become pivotal. And I say that they become pivotal when this kind of alliance or these kinds of parties make an electoral breakthrough that makes them a credible candidate for government or for um, shaping government policy. And it's at these kind of moments that kind of the framing contest around homosexuality really heats up. And it's also a, a time when LGBT, LGBT people feel that their immediate protective surround is now under threat. Um, and that that has those kind of galvanizing consequences for activism that we were talking about. So we can kind of think about um, categorizing countries and cases to make predictions uh, based on this. Um, and these are kind of ideal types, but I put some countries in the cells just to kind of show. So like down here in this, uh, sorry, up there in that corner, um, quadrant three, um, we have a kind of Polish example, the kind of benefits of backlash scenario. And what happened in Poland, as we'll describe, is um, after Poland joined the European Union, uh, suddenly the hard right came to power and they threatened uh, gay rights and the protective surround and they amplified the framing contest between EU rights norms and intolerant attitudes. And this brought high visibility, internal solidarity, and won lots of elites outside the movement as allies for the movement. Um, down here is kind of the opposite side. This is the Czech Republic. And this is uh, a little bit kind of paradoxical in a way because the Czech Republic is a country that otherwise you would think is a very good place for gay rights activism or promising um, because the society is open um, and the hard right is weak. 
Um, but what happened in the uh, Czech Republic is because they, you know, there isn't this threat to the protective sound and there's not visibility in sort of framing contests around homosexuality, is that everything, uh, the movement sort of trajectory depends on domestic conditions. And initially domestic conditions, as we'll talk about, were favorable in the Czech Republic, but then for various reasons domestic conditions become less favorable and the Czech movement sort of falters uh, over time. And then, you know, we could also look at this uh, area down here, quadrant two. It's kind of interesting hybrid. And I think the lesson from here is, is to show that there's nothing necessary about EU accession bringing uh, stronger gay rights movements. So here we have societies that are more closed, more conservative, um, but the hard right is weak. So basically, these are hard places to be gay or lesbian. Um, they have weak movements, and then they don't get the backlash. So they don't get these kind of mechanisms that we described. Slovakia, and in, the, in the book, the case that I really talk about that exemplifies this is Slovakia. So I'd like to illustrate this now. This is kind of the framework. And um, I'd like to illustrate this by focusing on Poland and the Czech Republic. And again, I think part of the attraction to me of looking at these two countries is one of them to the outcome is sort of surprising that in Poland, this country we associate with kind of like very strong Catholicism and, um, you know, the strong right-wing parties um, is actually the place where you find one of the most well-developed, well-organized gay rights movements in the post-communist area. Um, the Czech Republic, which is one of the most tolerant, most open societies, actually um, began having a, with a strong movement, but that movement kind of weakened and almost disappeared at one point over time. So, um, the first snapshot is 1989. Um, 1989 is, of course, when communism falls in Eastern Europe. Um, if we look at Poland, um, the gay and lesbian community is very much underground. It's local, it's informal, it's apolitical, there's no recognition by the state at all. In the Czech Republic, um, things are a bit better. Um, there's kind of interesting, one of the interesting things I learned when I was researching this was looking at sort of how the, the Czechoslovak state treated homosexuality under communism. Um, so what they had in the Czech Republic uh, was they had this very well-developed uh, network of what they called sexological institutes. It was basically a form of psychology um, dealing with you know, human Production. Um, and these uh, sexological institutes organized um, sort of therapeutic groups for gays and lesbians and bisexuals. Um, and so there was a kind of community that was organized and recognized with state assistance. Um, and these groups, then when 1989 came and communism was falling, they started to become organized. And they were actually even officially recognized in the course of the uh, fall of communism in the year 1989. As I said though, you know, the framing of homosexuality was not particularly political. It was framed in this kind of therapeutic, socio-therapeutic, psychological way. Um, if we skip ahead to an, another snapshot, 1997, so, um, you know, some time has passed. Both countries are not yet EU members, though kind of, um, wanting to join the European Union, but the leverage of the European Union is not particularly strong, especially in the issue of LGBT rights, because it took a while for the EU itself to become sort of uh, organized on this issue. Um, but if we look at Poland, what we saw, or what we saw at that time, is that the groups that had sort of started, that had kind of founded themselves in the early uh, 1990s, <laughs> and sort of had a kind of burst initially of some activity were on the way out. They were you know, very disillusioned. They didn't have money. They were kind of fighting with each other. And all the groups that had sort of sprung up in Poland basically dissolved, except for one. By um, 2001, there was only one LGBT group left in all of Poland, and it was in Warsaw. It was called Lambda Warsaw. Um, but all of the other groups had dissolved by 1997. And activism in Poland was, was, was very local, it was very informal, it was very apolitical, and it was based around sort of AIDS prevention um, and, and self-help. 
So the movement was very weak. In the Czech Republic, uh, kind of an opposite situation at the same time. So in, after 1989, there had been this flowering of local LGBT groups, um, but they very quickly um, kind of picked up and started linking up with each other. Um, and they, by 1997, had created this national organization, this national umbrella group, which was called SOHO. And SOHO was really quite amazing in, in their respects. It, it, was, it had formal organization, um, legal recognition, formal organization. It had full-time activists and stable funding from the state. Um, it operated its own media. It had political goals. And to quote one analyst, SOHO is the only, he was writing at the time, he said, SOHO is the only genuinely national gay and lesbian network in the former Soviet bloc, and arguably one of the best organized in Europe. So um, it was a very kind of high point for Czech movement. It was national activism, it was professionalized, and it was politically engaged. At the point, the EU, neither country had joined the EU yet. They were sort of on the cusp of doing so. The leverage of the EU was very high. The EU had sort of articulated a, a stance with regard to LGBT issues. Um, in Poland, um, there would be kind of a rebirth of the movement with kind of the support of the EU, a lot of funding support, and the role that Polish groups could play by positioning themselves between Poland's government and the, and the commission and the negotiations about membership. Um, so activism started to become more institutionalized. It started to become more politically engaged, but it didn't have a lot of visibility sort of outside in the wider society. Um, the EU frame resonated within the movement, but it wasn't something that was um, kind of building bridges to allies. They didn't have a, a national reach. They were still very much located in, in the main cities. Um, and the Czech Republic, um, on the other hand, you started to see some decline. Now this was, um, one reason for this is that because the, uh, homosexuality was less of a controversial issue in the Czech Republic, um, there was less of a kind of need for Czech groups to kind of position themselves to mediate between the, the government and the commission about uh, membership association. Um, and the movement was determined, again, as we said before, primarily by domestic developments. And at this time, the domestic developments, for reasons sort of not having anything to do with the EU, started to get um, less favorable. So mainly what happened was they lost state funding. The state stopped kind of funding the SOHO and the various groups through kind of AIDS prevention and various other things and the uh, reasons that they had for funding them. Um, also, at this time, the, the Czech activists had taken on this idea of same-sex partnerships. That was what they were organizing about. That had nothing to do with the EU, because the EU was not saying, like, to join the EU, you need to have same-sex partnerships. So they couldn't sort of frame it in new terms. But what it also did was it divided the movement itself. So it kind of created a split mainly between gays and lesbians who had different ideas about like what was sort of what single-sex partnerships should look like, um, how many rights should go along with them. Um, you know, long story short, the, the gay uh, <coughs> activists were happy to kind of take something that was much more pragmatic and easier to achieve and call a victory, whereas the, the lesbians wanted something that was much stronger in have more rights, but they, this, this split became very acrimonious between the two groups. Um, and so what happened was Soho broke apart, and um, the grassroots and the leadership split apart from each other as well. And the whole kind of strategy of focusing on, on same-sex partnerships also meant, you know, this kind of like lobbying campaign behind the scenes with politicians. They weren't kind of marching in pride parades and sort of trying to mobilize the grassroots. So activism was starting to deinstitutionalize and demobilize in the Czech Republic. It was still professional and political, but it didn't have a lot of internal solidarity, and it didn't have a framing that could draw domestic allies outside the movement. <coughs> okay, getting a stand here. So 2006. This is an important date because both countries have now joined the European Union. So if you think about kind of the uh, conditionality and leverage that the EU can um, exercise, it's basically gone now. Um, in Poland, the first, well, not the first, but one of the, you know, kind of the immediate 
after effects after they joined the EU was suddenly the right wing came to power um, in a big way. It's actually the party that's now in power again in Poland, a law and justice. So there was this kind of breakthrough by the hard right. Um, it was very much a campaign that was based on sort of uh, kind of Euro skepticism. And also they really put a lot of attention on um, gay rights. And so like, you know, one of the leaders of the party kind of made a big name for himself as the mayor of Warsaw by banning Warsaw's um, pride parade. Um, and there was a lot of kind of homophobic rhetoric, and so there was this threat to the protective surround that suddenly went to, from zero, you know, whatever, from two to ten. Um, and what were the consequences for the movement? Well, suddenly everything all the time was about gay rights and LGBT um, and the pride parade. So there was really high visibility for this issue that nobody previously had talked about in the public sphere. Um, there was a big upswing in participation and an internal solidarity. So you start to see like, you know, all of this kind of um, participation in prides and sort of uh, contesting bans on prides and all these kinds of things. Um, and the EU frame starts to resonate beyond the movement. In the Czech Republic, um, the hard right, you know, is just dwindling into insignificance over this period. Um, the LGBT movement had focused, as we said, on same-sex partnerships. They actually won same-sex partnerships in 2006, but it was a greatly watered-down version of same-sex partnerships that even the kind of activists themselves said was kind of symbolic more than real. Um, and the campaign had split the movement. As we said before, there was this kind of acrimony about what same-sex partnership should be and what the kind of um, strategy for trying to lobby for them what should look like. So after the legislation was enacted, everyone was sort of so upset that they just, you know, the two major groups that were let dissolve themselves. And so there was basically no movement, or no formal movement, um, right after uh, they, you know, win their big policy breakthrough. So there starts to be this kind of reversion that like activism starts to go back to kind of local level, it becomes informal, it becomes about recreational groups and social clubs and things like that, it's apolitical. Okay, so then finally, 2011, sort of as I was finishing up the field work for this, um, in Poland, uh, the kind of mobilizing trends that I've described have continued, um, and the movement uh, continues to build out its organization throughout the country. This campaign against homophobia is the main group in Poland, um, has these bases in each region of Poland. Um, there's lots of solidarity, lots of visibility. But then another thing happens that in the elections in 2011, they actually pick up a major political ally. So this political party is formed called Your Movement. Um, and they're very kind of secular and libertarian almost. Um, and they make LGBT rights one of their main campaign promises. And they actually win third place in the elections and they elect, for example, the transgender uh, member to parliament in Poland. So it was the first kind of transgender as far as I know transgender um, politician in Europe was elected in Poland uh, in 2011. Also the head of Campaign Against Homophobia, which was the biggest uh, Polish LGBT group, was elected to parliament as well. So, you know, it was really kind of this amazing kind of breakthrough where the movement becomes politically mobilized and, and actually successfully politically mobilized. Um, whereas in the Czech Republic, um, as I said, the major organizations had dissolved and around this time there's an attempt to refound them um, but it's uh, kind of, movement is sort of a shadow of its former self, organizationally speaking. I'll be very quick here because I think um, uh, I've been talking for close to the time I promised. Uh, so what are some lessons from this? I think the first lesson is the uh, importance of external leverage. So. You know, my core argument today has been that backlash pushes LGBT movements forward, but only under the right circumstances. Some people will find this very optimistic, um, that backlash makes things better. Um, I mean, they will point to a case like Russia, right? So Russia has lots of backlash, um, but the LGBT movement is not doing so great. Um, but if you look back in time at Russia in the early 1990s, you wouldn't have like, necessarily predicted that Russia would turn out differently than Poland. So in the... Um, homosexuality was decriminalized in Russia in 1993, 
uh, that had lots of exposure to transnational NGOs, uh, especially in connection with HIV AIDS, which was a big problem in Russia. There were moments of international scrutiny, like the Sochi Olympics in 2014. Um, but we know how the story turned out. You know, we know that there's very strong repression of LGBT groups. We know that prides are banned. We know that there was a ban on homosexual propaganda in 2013. You know, there's a horribly homophobic uh, political discourse, you know, from the very top down. Um, you only have to read the book by Valerie Sperling, um, Sex, Politics, and Putin, to kind of see that described. Um, but I would say that, you know, what we should do when we think about Russia is go back to the kind of mechanisms that I described as leading to um, more organized activism. So first of all was the connection between backlash and visibility. And I would say that, you know, this connection is pretty strong. Um, when the state targets, uh, or when you know, opponents target LGBT groups, that you know, almost always raises the visibility of the groups. It, it garners attention. Um, it was kind of inelastic. But if we think about the second of those two things, um, solidarity within the movement, there may be a little bit um, more responsive but there may be more of a kind of upper bound on that vis-a-vis -vis repression. So, you know, we argued that the threat to the protective surround allows people to take on greater risk of, to participate in a social movement than they would otherwise, but there's probably some limit of, you know, at which, you know, it becomes just too repressive and too risky. Um, so repression can work in the authorities' interest there. Um, and then last, if you think about allies, so how we argued before that um, the backlash can kind of bring allies onto the movement. These are probably, allies are most sensitive to the threat of repression, right? Because they don't have the internal or um, immediate protective surround of being threatened themselves. Um, they don't have kind of personal stake in the issue. And so they're very kind of probably responsive to repression. And if we think about Russia, it's a case, or it's a country that obviously can withstand a lot of international pressure, right? So there's not a lot of external leverage over Russia. We only have to think about what happened in Crimea, right? You know, so they invaded another country and uh, were able to withstand a whole lot of pressure and still retain Crimea. Um, so, so a case like Russia, I would say, basically shows us that you know. The absence of any kind of external leverage allows for unbounded backlash, and unbounded backlash is not good for movements. In the case that we've been looking at here, the European Union was always kind of hovering on the horizon, some bound of, uh, or some kind of leverage that bounded backlash. Final point uh, is to think about, you know, outcomes, organization versus policy change. So. Um, I think one of the things that I wrestled with when I was writing this was, you know, how, what to make sense of Poland and the Czech Republic. Because on the one hand, you know, I was I always really admired Poland because it had built this really strong movement. But on the other hand, it, they never actually achieved any kind of policy goals, really. Um, whereas the Czech movement uh, was kind of started strong, but like weakening over time. But they actually got like a, a tangible goal. They got same-sex partnerships. So, you know. What does this tell us? Um, so I would start by saying that you know social change is deepest when you have both robust social movements and rights reinforced in law, uh, or rights defined in law and reinforced by social movements that kind of live them. But you know, looking at the development of LGBT movements, comparatively, scholars have often pointed out that these two things don't always develop at the same speed. Um, and for example, looking again at another part of the rights periphery, um, someone who actually I took that term from, political scientist Omar Encarnacion, has, has argued that the rights pioneer in Latin America is, is Argentina. It's not Brazil, even though Argentina has a much weaker LGBT movement than Brazil does. Um, and Encarnacion actually kind of takes that point to sort of make a kind of different argument than my own. And he, he argues that in this era that we live in when uh, societal attitudes towards homosexuality are becoming more tolerant, and on the other hand, there's a consolidation of a transnational LGBT movement that can 
lend support to domestic movements, that the organization of domestic movements isn't as important anymore as it once was. That you know, these kind of domestic movements can rely on the international ones, and they can choose frames strategically that allow them, as happened in Argentina, to, to achieve big uh, policy goals. So I think this is a very provocative point, but I would say that it's, I would be very cautious in extending it beyond Latin America. So I'll show you a final slide here. So the first part of this, about the kind of rising attitudes towards homosexuality in different parts of the world, um, you can see here, this is again in this uh, World Values Survey, talking about attitudes towards homosexuality. Um, and South, South America is down at the bottom. So there is a trend towards increasing tolerance in South America, as you know, there is in Western Europe, as there is in North America. But if we look at you know, post-communist Eurasia, if we look at Africa, if we look at the Middle East, attitudes are on average still distinctly less tolerant. And these kind of trends are not really, you know, improving very dramatically, if at all. And I think the second point is that in countries where there's a combination of low social tolerance and, as we talked about before, weak external leverage, there isn't a kind of EU to provide some bound on backlash, um, the more appropriate measure of success may not be uh, you know, policy gains, but it may be preventing um, the hollowing out of rights that one already has. Um, or the retrenchment of rights and policies that one already has. And so I think here the, or the advantage of a strong organization becomes clear. So, you know, a grassroots that you can mobilize for protest events, that has a presence outside the capital city, that there's a network of allies outside the movement that can be drawn on, there are resources to mount legal challenges. All these things become really clear, all these advantages of organization um, where social attitudes are not that favorable and where backlash is not bounded by some external leverage. And I think Poland can kind of show that, actually, because as we said, you know, Poland, that government that we looked at in the mid-2000s is actually the government again. Um, and they have, since returning to power, attempted to kind of weigh in again on gender issues. This time it was less about um, LGBT issues per se, it was more about abortion. So you may have heard about this. Um, they attempted to um, change Poland's already very uh, restrictive abortion law to basically ban abortion in pretty much every case um, except saving a woman's life. And this sparked a very massive protest wave against uh, the government. Just to give you some figures, there were 116,000 people demonstrating in 90 Polish cities um, in 2016, and on October 3rd. And there were sister demonstrations in the US and in, in Europe. And after this wave of kind of counter-protest, in which the LGBT uh, groups played a very big role because they were kind of closely aligned with the feminists, um, the government actually backed down. And they said that, you know, they, the protest caused us to think, and they taught us humility. Uh, the quote. Um, so I think this is the example, again, of, of importance of having an organization. It may not necessarily win you um, immediately the, the policy goals you'd like, but it, it's a good bulwark to, to shore up what you have. So I'll end there and see if you have questions or comments. I'm happy to expand or take whatever questions you have. So thanks very much.